My name is Andy Bashir, and I'm honored to serve as your Attorney General. I love my job because every day that I go to it, I don't feel like I'm going to work. I feel like I'm going to serve a mission. And I know with what many of you all do, you understand that concept of mission. My mission in the Attorney General's office is pretty simple. I believe every Kentucky family ought to be able to live in a safe neighborhood and have a real path to prosperity. What does that mean? A safe neighborhood is a neighborhood free from violence and free from drugs. And a real path to prosperity isn't just the chance to get a job, but a good job, the type of job that you can leave your kids a little bit better off than you had it. We work every day on that mission in our office by addressing four challenges that can face any family, all of which have a health component. Number one is the prevention and prosecution of child abuse and human trafficking. Number two is better protecting our seniors against scams and abuse. Three is seeking justice for victims of rape and sexual assault. And number four is finding workable solutions to this drug epidemic that plagues each and every one of our communities. And while I'm going to focus exclusively today on that drug epidemic, I do have a piece of really exciting news. It's one we ought to celebrate every single time it happens. It was early Friday morning uh, through an investigation that included multiple state agencies. I'm really proud that our Department of Criminal Investigations rescued a 17-year-old human trafficking victim. This is our second rescue in about a year, and I hope it shows you the way we approach our jobs because in each situation, we also made an arrest, and we are going to hold that trafficker responsible. They are going to see justice, but the most important person in each and every one of those operations is that victim, and the services that so many of you all in this room provide to them are greatly appreciated. Our drug epidemic, I don't have to tell you how bad it is. Each and every one of you has lost somebody that you love and care about. Each and every one of you are in a field related to this epidemic, and still you have lost someone that you care about. Everyone's lost someone from their own neighborhood. I have. It was an 18-year-old who lived eight houses down from me. His friends, his friends, took his car keys, stole his wallet, and stole his car and left him on a driveway to die, and he did. And his then 16-year-old sister, who'd ridden her bike back and forth in front of my house for the five previous years, had to figure out what life means and, and how to go on. That was personal, but it got even more personal to me about two weeks ago. Two weeks ago, I was traveling in downtown Lexington. I was on Broadway and Short uh, with our investigator, Josh Keats, who's here today, and thank God he's a paramedic. We were six cars back from what looked like it was a traffic jam until we saw someone jump out of the first car on the left and start beating on the window and the first car on the right. The person in that car had just overdosed on car fentanyl. And as we turned on our lights and rushed over, he was turning blue. He then started turning purple. And as Josh will tell you, the next color is dead. So we wrestled him from that car. He was wedged in. We wrestled him from that car down to the street in the middle of those two lanes of traffic. Thank God Lexington police showed up in time with Narcan. Now all of my investigators carry it, and we were able to revive him. But, folks, this is 3 o'clock on a Thursday afternoon in downtown Lexington. It shows you that this isn't just the single greatest moral challenge of our time, not only was his life in danger, but he was operating a motor vehicle. Your life was in danger, too. But what we don't talk about is it's the single greatest threat to job growth, to that path to prosperity that we see in Kentucky. You know, there's a lot of talk in Frankfurt about this law or that law and whether or not it promotes jobs. Folks, if we do not get ahead of this drug epidemic, none of those laws will matter, no matter who's right on them. Take the mayor from an eastern Kentucky town that came to my office virtually in tears because her Walmart, one of the highest volumes in the state, won't upgrade. Why? Because they don't believe she can find 100 people in a five-county radius that can pass a drug test for three weeks. Take the Somerset auto supplier who had to fire 41 people in one shift. 
But you don't have to go far. Ask any major employer in any major city in Kentucky, and they cannot fill their jobs. They have to decide if when they put out uh, the information that they're seeking employees, whether they're going to mention they drug test because nobody shows up if they do. Or if on that first interview they do perform those drug tests, most people don't come back. This is the challenge of our times. And I want you to know the Attorney General's office takes it seriously and works to address it every single day. We do it on the law enforcement side. We have a DEA task force. We participate in that task force that chases the worst of the worst fentanyl and carfentanyl dealers. And we've had some success. That outbreak that started in Huntington and then moved to Mount Sterling, 12 overdoses, one fatality, jumped over to Louisville, over 30 in a 48-hour period, and then up to Cincinnati. We caught a really high-level dealer, and through a federal prosecution, he is never, ever going to be able to see the outside of a jail cell again. And when you have sold a drug knowingly that has killed that many people, that's the right result. We continue to have an Appalachian HIDA task force that makes sure that we don't have rogue doctors and rogue Suboxone clinics that will poison our communities with pills upon pills upon pills. But we also understand that even if we could cut off that flow tomorrow, we have so many people who are out there addicted. And who are they? They're our friends and our family members and our neighbors, and they need help. Yet from the state level, I don't believe we put nearly enough funding into substance abuse treatment. That's why I was proud as your attorney general to provide over $8 million of OxyContin settlement funds to 15 drug treatment centers all across Kentucky. I know some of them are here today. We had Freedom House in Louisville and Independence House in Corbin that used that money to help pregnant addicts give birth to healthy babies. To We had the Chrysalis House here in Lexington, Hope in the Mountains that was going to have to shut down in Prestonsburg that now is Medicaid eligible and able to provide so many services to other people. We had Mary Hurst in Louisville that was able to use this one-time money to create a self-sustaining outpatient drug treatment program in the Portland neighborhood of Louisville. They've treated over 350 kids and families and will continue to be able to do so moving into the future. It's what this type of investment makes. And making that investment is well worth it, is well worth it. So I'm not done yet. I announced about two weeks ago that we were going to pursue these national and multinational companies that have made billions flooding our communities with addictive pills. I'm not looking for punishment. I'm looking for responsibility. And if those companies won't take responsibility, then I'm going to see them in court. We recently launched, with 33 other attorney generals, a program to push insurers to prioritize non-opioid methods of treating pain, to try to create those in <laughs> to try to create the right incentives so that we could hopefully not start this addiction in the first place, and we already have uh, major insurers responding. And then three weeks ago, we launched a program that gives me the most hope out of anything I've done in this area as your Attorney General. Fact is, still, for 80% of people that are doing heroin, their addiction did not start with them making a decision to buy a street-level drug. Their addiction started with prescription pills. And with over 70% of them, it wasn't their prescription. It was from a family member or a friend. So the most dangerous places in our home are our medicine cabinets. And I have to think eight years ago when I had my first child, I did everything I could in my home to make it safe. I went through and plugged one of those things into every single outlet, and we have a lot of outlets. I anchored every piece of furniture in my house, including ones that it would take a small horse to pull over. But I never cleaned out that medicine cabinet. And for folks who want to do that, how do they do it? Pharmacies, for the most part, won't take them back, but we're working with groups like CVS and others to try to change that. Hospitals can't take them back in most situations. Just about every county has a drop box, but for many, there's transportation problems, and let's face it, in so many of our communities, you don't want your neighbor seeing you shovel these pills into the box, even if they were a legitimate prescription in the first place. That's why we launched the Kentucky Opioid Disposal Program, where for the first time, people can dispose of their prescription medications safely 
in their own home. We started with a pilot project which will fund 50,000 drug deactivation pouches in four counties and through senior programs all across Kentucky. It gives us the opportunity to deactivate over 2.24 million opioids that are sitting out there in people's medicine cabinets. And it's so easy. All you have to do is tear off the top of this. You can pour up to 45 pills in it, fill it halfway with water, wait 30 seconds, cinch it, and drop it in the trash. Totally deactivated. You could drink the water, but I wouldn't recommend it. And 100% environmentally friendly, even the package biodegrade. So think about that. At a time when Floyd County is detecting opioids in their water system, think about that. And I like to think about the hope, not just, not just what sometimes seems like the hopelessness in this opioid epidemic. If 80% of heroin users are starting with prescription pills, what if we could clean out every single medicine cabinet in Kentucky? What if we could get a deactivation pouch to every single family to make sure that medicine cabinet is safe? And what if every single time you got a prescription for a dangerous medication, you got the ability to dispose of the part that you don't use? Two things that happen. Two things that happen. I believe we would slow, if not reverse, the rate of new addiction. Think about that as hope. And the second thing we do is cut down on a lot of property crimes that we see here in Kentucky. It's a good motivator to clean out the medicine cabinet because when those folks walk into your house, they're not taking your TV anymore. They're going straight to your medicine cabinet, then to your jewelry box, and then leaving. But this program, the Kentucky Opioid Disposal Program, if we can get it out to every county, not just four, because we have three already coming up with the funding, we can make a real difference. Parents and grandparents won't worry about their kids or grandkids becoming addicted through what is in their medicine cabinet. We can truly impact the supply that is causing the most of our addiction. So I hope, both with the Foundation for Healthy in Kentucky, with different organizations that are in your region, I know Northern Kentucky is already doing some of this, that you will partner with us. Every single pouch we get out there might be the difference in between someone becoming addicted or getting to live that fulfilling life uh, without ever having to deal with that demon. Thank you all very much.